Hello everyone and good evening. Welcome to the first episode of the audiobook series here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And today, we will be reading the first few chapters from my debut novel, The Gathering. Now, I do want to mention early on that this is the second edition that was edited by my friend and fellow author and my editor, Lori Ball. She helped me refine this from the first edition, and now the second edition is the proper version, now out and available on BarnesandNoble.com. Now, for newcomers here on the channel, I do want to give you a little overview of The Gathering. Now, The Gathering was my first book that I published. It was actually the first full-fledged story that I wrote an outline for, fleshed it out, and I am just so very proud. Now, this cover was the first cover I ever made. This was like no edits, no uh, revisions, no nothing. This was as is. And I am so proud of this. There's a lot of memories with this cover, which I you know, really appreciate. And if you have not purchased a copy of The Gathering, let me read to you the synopsis. In a faraway land across space and time, the tyrannical sorcerer Kairos rules with an iron fist. His pantheon of warlords enforce his will over the Kronai, who lost all hope long ago. Then one fateful night, the last mage of the Kronai, uses a mystical moonstone to summon champions from a distant world. Soon, four warriors teleport from Earth, each torn from a crucial battle in human history. The stone steals Aminus, a Spartan, as he fights Persian invaders near Plataea in ancient Greece. Decimus, a Roman soldier, is taken while his army falls to Hannibal on the fields of Cannae. The Moonstone's power snatches Sinbol, the Celt, from a rebellion in early Roman Britannia. And the Viking siege of Paris loses Tyra, a Norse shield maiden bent on conquest. Now summoned to an alien world, these four champions meet others like them. Encountering treachery and unlikely allies, they uncover the origins of Kairos. But their unity undergoes the ultimate test when they face the mad tyrant at Castle Olympus. Will these heroes fight together? or be lost to the sands of time. So, here is the map that was made courtesy of Lori, also known as Autumn Amber. And without further ado, let us begin. Prologue. The night was cold with bitter winds. The icy breeze awoke the creatures of the night and they began to emerge from their afternoon slumber. A low howling from a wendigo could be heard throughout the forest, creating an eerie sense of fear. Dark shadows, wild beasts, and the lack of moonlight would make anyone fearful, except for one. Clothed in a heavy robe, this individual knew those sounds were the least of his worries. In the moonlight's twilight, he sprinted through the forest, an ancient magical leather book tucked under his arms. His legs grew weary, but he reached the forest's heart with sweat dripping off his brow. His heavy robe began to take a toll as he neared his destination. Ducking under branches and hopping over small streams, the robe stranger sighed as he arrived at his destination, the sacred stones of Olympus. The barking of dogs increased his stress levels, their masters sprinting with them, closing in on him. Time was closing its window on him. Falling to his knees, he removed the leather book and spread through the pages. He scanned until he found the right spell. A chrono uxcori, otherwise known as a time spell. He pulled a red gemstone from his cloak and placed it in the center with his palms together. He then recited the incantation in his people's language, an ancient tongue. As he spoke, the stones began to turn blue and glow 
in with intense brightness and clarity. The rigid outline swelled in the center of the rocks until a portal between time and space tore open. Through the portal, images of battles became visible. He could see everything and needed to choose quickly. Making his decision, he began to recite the final phrase. However, the phrase was interrupted by his pursuers, who had arrived at the worst possible moment. Dogs were panting hard, with jewel dripping from their muzzles. The razor-sharp teeth gleamed in the moonlight, and their eyes glinted red. The pursuers were his own people, accompanied by the war god and lord of the pantheon. We found him, Lord Ares, said one of the beast masters. Excellent work, said Ares. His beard was still stiff from the dried blood from Eon's past. Ares wore black armor adorned with a shredded cape on the back. He stood around eight feet tall with a muscular build. His arms were the size of tree trunks, legs firm as stone, and eyes as bright as the sun. Unsheathing his Zypho sword, a mere reflection of the double-edged blade from the Hellenistic Age, he pointed it at his quarry. His voice was full of malice and rage. You gave us quite the chase, mage. But now it ends here. Surrender and I will give you a quick death, said the war god. The mage remained motionless and continued with the chant. That was a big mistake, because Ares did not like being ignored. He gestured to two of his fellow soldiers to apprehend the mage. As the two got close, they immediately incinerated. A protection spell was put around the stones by the mage. It may have worked on regular soldiers, but would do little to Ares. If you want something done right, do it yourself. Ares began to walk towards the barrier. Knowing what would happen, the individual tried to finish the last phrase of the chant. His heart pounded in his chest as he heard the sound of the barrier cracking underneath Ares' strength. Fear filled his mind, but he could not afford to make a mistake. Knowing the barrier would shatter soon, the mage finished the last part of the spell, and the portal exploded into the starlit sky and then disappeared. It left a bluish hue in the night sky as he breathed a sigh of relief. He hoped the portal reached its destination, planet Earth. Before Ares could reach him, he grabbed the stone and teleported it away. In rage, Ares grabbed the sorcerer by the neck and slammed him to the ground. The force shattered the stone floor, breaking the sacred site. The sheer power of the slam crushed several of the sorcerer's ribs, and red liquid peeled from the corner of his mouth. Ares placed his blade on the sorcerer's neck and drew even more blood. You think you figured it out. But how long will you keep calling your champions for help? Ares then began to mock the sorcerer. I thought you and your people would have learned your lesson by now. I mean, all those deaths were your fault. Have you nothing to say? The man spat at Ares' face as his response. Smirking, Ares picked up the sorcerer and threw him over his shoulder. Licking the blood off his sword, Ares looked at the night sky. He saw a figure towering above him. The figure was Zeus, his underling and lord of the skies. I take it you know what just happened, said the Thunder God. I'm sick of picking off warbands across this forsaken region. Let me kill some earthlings for a change. It'll be like the old days, back in the Great Purge. In his twisted way, Ares was delighted. He had not killed humans for some time now. And the stone? Zeus saw that neither the mage nor his lord Ares possessed the stone. The sorcerer knows where it is, and most likely hid it in his village. Take him back to the castle and imprison him until further notice. While you're there, send out a scouting party and have them search the outlands until they find the stone. Handing the body to Zeus, the Thunder God zipped into the night. Turning his back to the sacred stones, Ares wondered what new warriors he and the others would face. He chuckled at the idea of new champions putting up a fight and believing they would win. They will die like all the rest. Nothing will change. Chapter 1 Plataea 479 BC Today was going to mark the end. Years of fighting, countless men lost, the massacre of Thermopylae, and Athens burning had led to this. They celebrated the final engagement of the Persian invaders 
and the Greek warriors at Plataea. The combined forces of Sparta and Athens created a coalition force to match their Persian counterpart. The Greeks had to win this battle. The Persians lost their entire navy a year earlier and are now stranded on land. However, this was the same Persian army that fought against Spartan king Leonidas not long ago. The alliance made camp outside the walls of a small town and waited for the enemy. They knew the Persians were close, but the generals did not know where. Hours passed until the Greek commanding officer, Pausanias, nephew of the fallen king Leonidas, received a report from one of his scouts. What news have you brought me? asked Pausanias. The scout had to catch his breath before applying. Commander, the Persian army is near. They will advance come morning, replied the scout. Pausanias seemed intrigued by the news. Who is commanding the army? Mardonius, sir. He is in command of what remains of the Persians. Infantry, cavalry, and the army's deadliest unit, the Immortals. The ones responsible for the death of the 300 Spartans. Pausanias smiled upon hearing the report. Their enemy was less than a mile away from camp. The Spartan had a gleam in his eyes, eager for the battle ahead. He grabbed a cup of wine and gave it to the young Greek. Thank you, boy. And I'll spread the word to the others. I know they're itching for a fight. The young Greek gulped the wine and bowed before leaving the tent to spread the word. Alone again, Balsanius looked up at the night sky and spoke, almost whispering to the spirits of the fallen. He poured himself another cup and raised his glass high. This is for you, all the Greeks who have died. You will be avenged soon. The scout went from campfire to campfire throughout the night, reporting his news to every Greek soldier. When the scout arrived at the Spartan camp, <clears throat> in case in bronze, a handsome youth greeted the scout. To his peers, Aminus was his name. Aminus had curly brown hair like his father and amber eyes like his mother. Physically strong and in good health, Sparta deemed him the youngest soldier to serve due to his boyish face. In truth, he was twenty winters, and by right, a man. Like all Spartan children, he trained in the Agoge, a lifelong boot camp that taught young Spartan boys to become Spartan men. When his mother enlisted him at seven years of age, his teachers baptized him in the art of war. In the Agoge, he learned how to defend for himself. Yet unlike his fellow Spartan brothers, Aminus was much stronger than your typical child. Many felt that the god Heracles blessed him with unnatural strength. <clears throat> no one believed it at first, and thought of it as simple gossip. However, one winter at eleven years of age, he was tasked to live in the wild at winter's height. Here, he would earn a new name. The cold air stung his face and turned an icy blue, but he did not recognize the pain. One cold night, as he gathered firewood, he found his home taken by a lone bear. Not as large as those found the volley, but still posed a challenge to the young Spartan. Armed with only a wooden spear, he approached the intruder. The bear recognized the threat and let out a low growl. The sound meant nothing to the young Spartan, and the bear exited the cave and faced the young boy head on. The two predators circled each other, studying and evaluating. Both thought of who would make the first move. Aminus lunged forward, jabbing his spear at the beast. The spear pierced the bear's skin, not enough to kill it, but enough to make him mad. The bear then swiped the spear away from the boy and raised a paw. In one slash, the claws dug deep into the boy's chest. Blood oozed everywhere. Despite the pain, it only seemed to fuel Aminus more. With a blood-curdling scream, he charged at the bear in a blind fury. He tackled the beast to the ground and proceeded to strangle his adversary. The bear squirmed, freed one of its paws, and slapped the young Spartan off him. The blow stunned Aminus. But he recovered quickly as the bear held on to him, his mouth gaping open. The young Spartan held the bear back, 
Aminus could smell the stench coming from the beast's gaping maw. Hot drool dripped onto his face. Still fueled by his bloodlust, Aminus gripped the bear's upper and lower jaw and opened its mouth further. The pain angered the bear, causing it to rear up on its hind legs and envelop the human being in a tight hug. Aminus could feel his body ache, but could not afford to lose. Struggling to free his arms, he heard his bones began to creak. Pushing through the pain, he managed to free his arms, grabbing the bear's mouth again. Aminus opened the upper and lower jaws even further than before. He could hear the slight sound of the bones breaking and gums tearing. Then, with his last ounce of strength, he broke the bear's jaw killing it. The creature slumped to the ground, with Aminus falling over it. The young Spartan returned days later, wearing the bear's skin as his cape and trophy. From then on, he was known as Arkodaki, the little bear, a name that matched his inner beast. From then on, Aminus earned a reputation for being one of his age's most dangerous Spartans. He bested his friends and brothers in arms in combat during the summer, gained the eye of the elite, which then pushed him to challenge much older Spartans to test his might. He earned a beating in some instances, but in others, he delivered them themselves. By the time he was 19, the Agoge transformed him into a six-foot living demigod. Despite training and gaining his elders' respect, he did not partake in the Battle of 300, which angered the boy. Upon hearing the aftermath at the hot gates, he found his opportunity. He then received the Spartan armor, which was made entirely of bronze. Though rather heavy for him, it was light as air. On his back was a light spear made of sturdy oak and tipped with an iron spearhead. His helmet and shield belonged to his father, as both were signs of battle damage. He received it upon hearing of his death at the Battle of Thermopylae. In the present day, Aminus looked at the young scout, who was no older than him. The Spartan spoke in a deep voice that made the scout flinch. What news have you brought? The scout stuttered a bit. This was his first time meeting a Spartan up close. Gathering his thoughts, the scout gave his reply. The Persians are close. They will, he they will be here at dawn. Make sure your Spartans are ready. Thank you for the information. Report back to your commanders at once said the Spartan calmly. The scout bowed and ran back to camp. The Spartan looked to his left, admiring the vast open land, the thing that the Greeks' enemy, who seemed so far away, were closer than originally thought. His anger for the Persians burned inside him. His father died, along with many others at the Thermopylae Pass. He wanted retribution, and he would have it soon. Aminus then turned around and headed back to his commander's tent. Walking through the camp, he passed his fellow Spartans, Boys he fought and trained with at a young age. Every man in this army was a brother, and they protected their own. All of them had lost family to the Persians. He knew that when the battle commenced, no quarter would be given. Arriving at the commander's tent, he was stopped by two elite Spartan pole marks. Those chosen to be the commanding general's guards. State your name, asked one of the guards. Aminus removed his helmet. My name is Aminus Baru, and I have information for the general. It's important. Let him through, said a voice inside the tent. The two guards allowed Aminus to pass. As he entered, he bowed before his commander and the officers. Setting his helmet on the table, the young Spartan relayed the information he received and presented written verification to his commanding Spartan general, Amonfredus. The older Spartan unraveled the parchment and read it thoroughly. Amonfredus passed the news to his officers, who began reading it as well. After a brief silence, one of the Spartans looked up. Is this accurate? inquired the Spartan. Yes, it is, sir, said Aminus. They'll be here at dawn. Amonfredus smiled with satisfaction. <clears throat> Finally, the Spartans would avenge their fallen king and fellow brothers at the Thermopylae Pass. He turned his attention to Aminus and patted him on the shoulder, showing his appreciation. This news pleases me, Aminus. We will avenge our fallen comrades tomorrow and bathe the ground with Persian blood. Tomorrow, we will end this war once and for all. I look forward to it, sir, Aminus said with pride. 
After his father's death, Amos quickly joined the army. He could not think of a better way to begin his military career than being part of this coalition. Grabbing his helmet, he placed it back on and left the tent. Amon Freitas turned his attention back to his two officers and gave them new orders. Tell every man to be ready. Have the weapons sharpened and shields polished along with their helmets. No drinking tonight, understood? I want every man sober tomorrow and in fighting strength. Now go. The two officers nodded and left the tent. Back with Amonis, he was at his tent on the east side of camp. As he entered the tent, he set aside his shield and helmet and lay on his bed. Unfortunately, he could not fall asleep. The thought of tomorrow's battle was all he could think about. His training had led him to this moment, and now it was here. I think his mind rests for tomorrow. He closed his eyes and drifted to sleep. The following day, he and the rest of the army readied for battle. Some of the men watched, others put their armors on. Helmets, shields, body armor, spears, and swords were polished and ready for the carnage ahead. I'm on Freitas at the head of the army, wearing his favorite red cloak into battle. The red color cast a shadow that blanketed the army. He ordered the military to march in close formation with his officers beside him. Huddled together, the Spartans left their camp and joined the rest of the Allied coalition. As the army marched across the grassy field, one Spartan officer saw the Persians' faint outline across from them. Amon Freitas halted the Spartans several yards away from the main army. In clear view, they saw their hated foe. Amonif breathed, a he breathed heavily and tightened his grip on his shield and spear. His palms were sweaty and his breathing grew rapid. Trained to the peak of the human condition, the young warrior could feel the cold shiver of fear run down his spine. One Spartan to his left nudged him out of his trench. Quit worrying so much, it will get us killed. The other Spartan was right. Fear in their ranks would be dooming to everyone. Taking a moment to calm himself, Aminus hardened his gaze at the Persians. No one dared to say anything. The Spartans prepared themselves for the enemy. Suddenly, the Persian cavalry began to charge only several yards away. Not too far behind, Mardonius and his immortals followed. Amonfrey is in order shield wall or phalanx. The phalanx was a shield wall of eight rows of men in tight formation, and offered the best protection against archers, light infantry, and cavalry. The men tightened their formation and leaned forward, with shields in front to protect, and their spears poised ahead to thrust. With the enemy rushing towards them, Amon Freya's counterattacked. Full of battle fury and rage, the Spartans charged at the enemy. The sounds of boots and horse hooves thundered across the grassy fields. The chants from both the Spartans and Persian forces filled the skies. Time seemed to stop as the two armies closed the distance between them. No noise of birds, no cries of horses, or even the sounds of men prepared for battle. In a split moment, there was nothing. Suddenly, shields crashed into each other. Spears piercing armor and flesh, and dying men screamed as they continued to fight on. Amnes heard all of this. He and a few other Spartans broke formation once the Persian defenses crumbled. No prisoners! No mercy! Amnes shouted at the top of his lungs. In his fury, he launched himself at a group of Persian immortals. Bloodlust consumed him as he began to attack his Persian enemies. The young Spartans' attacks were a miss of ferocity and skill. He bashed one enemy soldier with his shield and stabbed him in the heart with the tip of his spear. Blood oozed out of the soldier's chest as he weakly tried to remove the spear. Amnus ripped the spear out and continued to fight. The carnage ensued for hours as more Persians began to lay the field. More and more were being huddled together and slowly killed by the Spartan army. Today was the day when Persia died. Amnus' helmet and shield were covered in blood as he continued hacking down more Persians kicking a soldier and raising his sword to finish him. However, before he delivered the final blow, he heard the sound of thunder come over him. As he looked up into the sky, he saw dark clouds approaching. Something told him to worry. This was no ordinary storm. The clouds appeared to be much darker than usual. Both sides stopped fighting as they looked up into the sky for a moment. Suddenly, streaks of blue lightning fell upon the soldiers. Persian and Greeks alike were incinerated by the flash, charred to a crisp. Only the weapons remain. Chaos took the field as soldiers tried to run from the lightning. Amnus tried to flee, but the Spartan was struck with such force and power unlike before, and a loud crack consumed him. The lightning engulfed the Spartan and scorched the earth around him. However, the lightning did not incinerate him instantly. 
Instead, he felt himself being torn apart piece by piece. He screamed in agony as the pain was unbearable. Then the lightning disappeared. And the only part of Aminus left at Plateo was the scorched earth where he once stood. Chapter 2 Canai, 216 BC, the Second Punic Wars. Two years earlier, in the southern regions of the Roman countryside, Decimus Aquila sat outside his villa and marveled at the glorious sight. His home was near the coast, allowing him to hear the sounds of waves crashing upon the shore. In its fields grew grain and vineyards. The sun's comforting rays shone brightly on his marble stone house. From the corner of his eye, he saw his two sons, Romulus and Justinian, playing near the trees. Romulus had his mother's hair and light skin, while his brother looked more like his father. He smiled and wished more moments like this could last forever. Enjoying the view, came a lovely voice. Decimus glanced upward and saw his wife, Flavia. Her golden hair and green eyes reminded him of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. She knelt and kissed his forehead. I see the harvest went well today. She noticed the grain stock pile on the family farm. Nature has treated us fairly, my love. With this grain, I can sell it in Rome, and we can finally move our new home in the north. Just then, the couple heard the sounds of horses approaching the villa. Desmond got up from his chair to investigate. Flavia handed her husband his sword and called the children to enter. The horses stopped in front of the villa, and mounted on them were Roman soldiers. Desmond removed the hand from his sword. He knew these men. Alexius and Marcus Invictus. What brings you here? The two brothers dismounted from their horses and embraced their former commander. In his youth, Decimus was a skilled cavalry soldier in the military. He retired shortly after he married Flavia. He wondered why his former subordinates would meet him in full regalia. Alexius was the first to speak. I wish our arrival was under better circumstances, but the Senate has issued the raising of a new army. Hannibal's forces have crossed the Alps. Decimus are stunned. No army has ever successfully crossed the Alps. That is not possible. To Decimus. Then Marcus spoke. It gets worse. His army is marching to Rome from the north and grows with every warring tribe he encounters. Our sources say his army is 50,000 men strong. The color on the Romans' face went pale. The last time he heard of a massive army was the Persian invasion of Greece. How does this concern me? The Senate has issued a decree that all officers report for Imperial Army training. That includes retired men as well. What? I'm being asked to re-enlist? Asked Desmond. Flavia was furious. She walked over to Alexios and slapped him across the face. How dare you? How dare you both come here with this news? Forcing him to go back to fight your wars. Has he not done enough already? Her face was red and her voice was harsh. Marcus tried to reason with her. It's not like we had a choice, Flavia. We're all being called back. There are now more recruits than officers in the army, and Desmond was among the many called upon to train these recruits. We're leaving tonight. Flavia turned her back and walked away from the soldiers. Desmond sighed and looked back at his friends. Is the crisis that bad? Alexios ran his hand through his hair. Desmond is so much worse. Hannibal has bested two consul commanders. His strategy and approach to war are unparalleled. He means to sack Rome and burn to the ground. The Senate needs officers to get these recruits ready. Alexios paused. If we don't stop him, we'll lose our homes and country. Decimus thought long and hard about what Alexios and Marcus said. After a long silence, he looked back at his friends. <sighs> All right. Where do I meet you both? We're meeting outside the village and making the journey to the military campfire of miles away, said Alexios. Decimus pondered for a moment before responding. All right. I'll meet you then, he said to them. The two brothers mounted their horses once more and rode back into the village. Later that day, Desmond made the most of his time with his family. He played with his sons, told them stories of his past, and many other things. After his sons went to bed that night, Desmond went to the farm to retrieve his equipment. As he entered the barn, he saw Flavia holding a torch. I'm not going to lie to you, said Desmond. Then don't. Flavia put the torch aside and handed her husband his military uniform equipment. Taking the bundle in his arms, the old soldier set it aside and pulled his wife in for a kiss. Their lips met, and the passion between them still burned. I love you. I will come back to us. Don't make a promise you can't keep. 
Flavio replied. Grabbing his material, Desmond mounted one of the horses in the stables and rode off. That was the last time he saw them. The very last time. Present day. In three years, Rome lost countless men beyond the point of grief. Trebia and Trasmin were two of the most costly defeats the young republic faced. Fear soon swept itself into the Senate, and as a result, the Senate raised a force of 75,000 men, the greatest Rome had ever mustered. Various militiamen were in this army, including Decimus Aquila, Roman commander of the Allied Cavalry. Hailing from southern Italy, Decimus had been fighting this war since the beginning. He had seen men he trained slaughtered in one day, and the casualties were growing. Despite their training and large numbers, nothing improved their situation in three years years. No longer young, but not quite old. Decimus had grown weary of every engagement with Hannibal. The Carthaginian general was always one step ahead of the Romans. Even in their dire situation, with morale low and spirits dwindling, Decimus tried to give his men hope, even if it was a fool's hope. Stationed only 30 miles from Hannibal's army in Cannae, the Romans sat in his tent with a candle beside him. Before him was a scroll made of papyrus, unraveled and blank. As he jammed his pen into an ink jar, he hesitated to pick up the stylus as too many emotions filled his mind. A tightness grabbed his throat, and water began emerging from his eyes. His beating heart raced in his chest, and Decimus knew it had to be done. But did he have the strength to do it? Taking several deep breaths in, he slowed his heart rate. Best to be done with it, he whispered. Taking the pen, he dabbed the tip into the inkwell and began writing. His emotions fell upon the page with every stroke as he wrote a letter to his wife in Rome. My dearest love, Flavio, I long to see you and the boys one last time before the end. I hope you can someday forgive me for re-enlisting. However, as a soldier and patriot of Rome, I cannot allow a foreign evil to destroy our homes and people. I have seen his carnage firsthand at Lake Trasmin and Trebia. Every day we hear reports of his movements and thus march to engage him. Morale is low in the camp. However, a few other officers and I keep the hope alive, reminding the men why and what we fight for. If this is to be my last letter to you, know that I have always loved you and died for our home, our land, our lives, and the beautiful family you and I have made. Your loving and devoted husband, Decimus. Decimus put down the inkwell and let his letter dry before sealing it. He rubbed his tired and weary eyes. How much longer can we endure? The aging Roman soldier asked himself. His once bright brown eyes were now dull and devoid of joy. He had seen and lost too much in these past years. Getting up from his chair, he stretched out his back and decided to go for a night walk. Leaving his tent, he passed other soldiers, trying to kill time. Some played betting games, read poetry, or rested. His walk took him to a small hill near the camp boundaries. Upon reaching the incline, he turned to see the numerous campfires across the valley. The fires could be seen for miles. I wonder how many of them will live to see tomorrow. Decimus knew this war would cost lives, but he never imagined the loss of life on this scale in such a short period. Even amongst the men, they bed on each other to see who would survive the longest. No one won in the end. Feeling the gentle autumn breeze, Decimus took his time enjoying the serene moment, wondering if tonight would be his last night alive. With a sigh, he looked at the night sky and saw the countless stars blanketing the night. Though he was not religious, Decimus always viewed the stars as fallen soldier spirits, watching over and comforting the living. Knowing he would need his strength for tomorrow, Decimus ascended from the hill and returned to his tent. Once inside, he removed his worn sandals and allowed his feet to breathe. Before blowing the candle out, he saw his helmet, armor, and sword hanging. When he first joined the army in his youth, his equipment was brand new and shined like the sun. However, his armor was a shadow of his former self. After three years of war, his helmet was smeared with dirt, his armor dented by numerous arrows and spears, and his sword once a sign of strength and power 
was now a flat piece of metal encased in a wooden scabbard. Laying on the floor, the old soldier closed his eyes and drifted off into his sleep. The following day, Decimus awoke abruptly. Looking up, he saw one of his subordinates fully clothed in battle armor. Sorry for the rude awakening, sir, but the army is moving out soon, and we need you in the front, said the soldier. Desmus blinked a few times, yawned, and replied to the man. All right, just give me a few minutes. I'll be out shortly. Just fetch me my horse once you're outside. The soldier saluted and left the tent, allowing Desmus to get change. He splashed water on his face to wake him up, then grabbed his armor and dressed himself. Tying his sword belt around his waist, he gave one last check to ensure everything was secure. Putting his helmet on, he grabbed his letter from the desk and put it in one of his pouches before he left. Just before meeting his men, he remembered one last thing. He went back to his desk and picked up his golden eagle necklace. The eagle was the symbol of Rome. Unlike most Romans, Des the Miss rarely offered sacrifices to the gods. However, after re-enlisting in the army, he accepted that perhaps everyone needed a guardian watching over them. Putting it around his neck, he clasped the talisman and recited a short prayer for him and his men. Finishing his prayer, he left the tent and found his horse saddled and ready. Holding the reins was the soldier Desmond met briefly. The soldier handed the reins over to his commander and went back in line with the rest of the men. Placing one foot on the stirrup, he pulled himself onto the horse. Given the order, he and the rest of the unit marched the 30-mile trek to Kenai to face Hannibal. Looking over his shoulder, he saw the men behind him, all tired and weary. They had lost many brothers, including Marcus and Alexius. Putting those thoughts out of his mind, his unit followed the main army into the valley. Marching further in, Desmus realized that the flanks of the cavalry were being pushed closer together, tightly packed and going in one direction. This does not bode well for the Roman. This already feels like a losing battle. We're being pushed together, which limits us from going straight. If Hannibal were to attack us now, it will be a massacre. Desmus kept this thought to himself. He didn't want anyone to know what he was thinking. As they continued to march, the Union received word that the infantry had already engaged Hannibal's forces. Though he could not see the fighting, Decimus could hear the sounds of battle. The faint sounds of steel clashing and men dying echoed through the valley. The noise grew even louder, and Decimus's fears were finally realized. A loud galloping noise came toward him and his men. It was Hannibal's Gallic and Spanish cavalry galloping at full speed. Decimus ordered his men to draw swords and ordered a countercharge. Soon the units charged at full speed towards one another. Left and right, Desmus swung his sword and sliced off one soldier's head and slashed the other across his throat, blood gushing from his neck. It was a bloodbath. Fear had taken hold of the Roman army. In his years of military service, Desmus discovered fear for the first time. He was horrified and stunned by the carnage around him. Men cried out for their mothers, while others cursed the gods for their demise. He was too caught up in his thoughts that a Gallic soldier pulled him off his horse. Decimus landed hard on his side. In the present, he turned around and dodged the wild Gallic slash. Decimus gasped as he struggled to get up to his feet. Lunging forward, he tackled the barbarian to the ground. In the ending struggle, he tried to draw his dagger. However, the Gallic soldier suddenly kicked Decimus off him and grabbed the weapon from him. Before Desmond could react, the wild soldier rushed and stabbed him in the shoulder with his blade. Ah! He cried out. Kicking the gall away from him, he pulled the knife out of his shoulder. The blade made a clean entry through and missed any vitals. However, his arm was hindered, and Desmond was now furious. Roaring, he grabbed a nearby rock off the ground and swung it at the gall. The blow from the stone knocked the gall down, but Desmond was not done with him. Getting on top of him, he repeatedly bashed his skull even more. It was brutal. Over and over, Desmond's bashed the barbarian skull with the rock, until his face was nothing more than soft flesh and broken bones. Be gone, he shouted at the dead man. His eyes were widened and his face was bloody. He looked all around. Violence had consumed everyone. Taking a few deep breaths, he threw the rock away and put the dagger back in its sheath. He wanted to unsheath his sword, but knew the battle was lost. For so long, he fought for duty in Rome. But now, a primal urge emerged. Survival. He needed to run away from this battle and return to his family. As he ran through the field, he saw men being pulled off their horses and killed. While others cut down the enemy, or they themselves cut down. 
by enemy cavalry. Panting heavily, the pain in his shoulder began taking hold of him. Moving through the valley looking for a horse, he was greeted by a Spanish cavalryman charging him. Heart racing, he looked around to find a weapon near him. It was a pilum, a throwing spear. He dashed for the spear and threw at the charging enemy. The spear penetrated the cavalryman's breastplate and knocked him off his horse. Blocking out the pain, he ran to the horse and quickly galloped away. He saw another, he saw another of Hannibal's cavalry attack. This time, assaulting the Roman flank through the chaos. His fatal prediction had come through. Barely making it out of the valley, he saw the Carthaginians slowly push the Romans into a kill point with no escape. From where Desmond stood, he heard the screams of Roman soldiers and fallen horses. All those young and old men were dying, and he could do nothing to save them. His heart was burning with hatred, anger, and sorrow. Hot tears formed in the corner of his eyes, but despite his convictions, he was powerless. Taking one last look at the fatal scene, he rode away. As he escaped, the pain in his shoulder began to ache again, taking on a new form. Suddenly, sparks of blue flame began to consume Decimus and his horse. He tried putting out the fire, but it did little as the blue flames took over. The pain was excruciating, and Desmond could feel himself being burned away. Was his punishment for the, from the gods for his cowardice? Before he had a chance to react, a blue light blinded him, almost to the point of him losing his sight. Then in a flash... Him and his horse were gone. In a twist of fate, the only thing left untouched by the flame was his letter to his wife and family, perfectly placed on the ground where he once stood. And with that, my fellow listeners, we will stop here for the first episode in the audiobook series of The Gathering. Now, this will be a weekly series, and it will be every Sunday. may not be evening, but it will be every Sunday. So be on the lookout for that, as well as be on the lookout for the first few chapters of Aminus and of Persia, which will be coming soon. Thank you all so very much. I hope you enjoyed this little introduction to the first in this series. And as always, make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what was your favorite part of the first three chapters. And I will see you all in the next episode.